You guys have all heard about Mark. Um, he's uh, my dad and Mark have coached together. I've known I don't know since I was eight, since I was eight, or maybe before that. A long time. So Mark's joke was I was either going to end up in prison or be a millionaire. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But um, We're still a work in progress. I will. It's starting. It's going in the right direction. It's so starting far. finally to go in the right direction. So no. Um, but uh, yeah, Mark and my dad used to coach. Um, you know, individuals like I have done with Mark. They've coached with teams. And so as I've started to coach with Mark, uh, it's probably been five, what, four, six months now, maybe. Uh, somewhere between yeah. four and six. So about seven, eight months ago, <laughs> I was looking around, like saying, like, hey, what the? You know, I, I was evaluating my life. And for me, the reason why I started coaching was I was noticing that I was wearing a lot of hats that were uncomfortable for me because I was all over the place. And, you know, some days were, were amazing and some days were a little bit harder um, depending on the problem that was going on. And so as I've started to coach with Mark and he's helped me, you know, see the world in a different light, um, when I meet with you guys and hear your guys' challenges, uh, I just, you know, I don't have the IQ yet to push that onto you guys, but I just kind of, not laugh inside, but I just smile. Going like wow, if I could get Mark incorporated into the company with you guys, like we could really we could really do something. So uh, Mark told me about um, life mastery. I don't really know too much about it except for what I've read online. Hopefully you guys all did the homework and read about that online. Um, but he's going to talk to us a little bit about it today. He's going to do a little bit of Q and A. Uh, I'd like to get out of here at three o'clock, and so we'll kind of shoot for that. If we go a little bit over, it's not a huge deal. Um, but honestly. I'm just really excited for this. Uh, Mark's phenomenal. If, if we had an example of Chase came up here and said, hey, I'll give you a million dollars, you can choose a million dollars or coach with Mark for the next year, I honestly would, would coach with Mark. So, Or just give me the million. Or just give me the million. Oh so. You're all thinking it right. <laughs> <laughs> There's Mark. So, <laughs> Well, thank you, Cam. Uh, obviously, this is fun for me, being with my buddy Clyde or all of these years, and now Cam, who has turned out to be uh, just, you know, if I had to say, you know, the ideal coaching client, it's Cam, and the reason is because he wants it. And even if whatever it is he started out wanting, in the end, we all want the same thing. Somebody could say they want a Lamborghini, somebody could say whatever, but in the end, we all want the same thing. And that's why it makes it possible for us to coach large groups of people without having them all, you know, with all their individual needs, well, underneath it all, we're all pretty much alike. Uh, but ultimately, all you need is, a, is, if you want to get results, if you want to have power and control over your life, is a commitment. And something that you learn through the, our training is you learn the power of commitment. You learn that if you say it, and then you do it, and other people see you do it, there's nothing you can't do. You start with something very small. Like, you know, I'm going to stand up. I do this as a fun little experiment. So I, I, I'd love you all to say, I'm going to stand up. Go ahead. Say it like you mean it. I'm going to stand up. All right. Humor me. Stand up. See, Clyde gets a hand. Just stand up, of course. Because if you don't, then you haven't kept your, your commitment. And thank you. So then you stand sit up. down. And we say, did you stand up? Kayla. All right, girl. There we go. And it starts with something this simple, but the idea is, okay, so right now your commitment was that you're going to stand up. That wasn't too tough. But you did it, and your brain was watching. And it said, oh, so you seem to do what you say you'll do. And I was watching, and everybody else was watching. And now, right now I'm going, so far everyone in this room has done everything they said they would do. And that's powerful. And so imagine that you get the power of, as time goes on, you start making bigger commitments. It's not just I'm going to stand up. It's I'm going to lose this weight. I'm going to do this with my life. I'm going to learn. I'm going to get my master's. I'm whatever that is. I'm going to hyper serve the customers. We're going to be the biggest in the world in this in our field. Those commitments, you work your way up to them. But what happens is our lives are completely controlled by our subconscious. Even the conscious decisions you make are based on your subconscious uh, underpinnings, conditioning. And so we get you to a place where you make the commitment, your subconscious goes to work, says, okay, I better figure out how to do it. And it starts seeing opportunities everywhere you look, and things start appear to be falling into place, but they're really not. They've always been there. You just couldn't see them. 
And so uh, we get you to a place where you not only understand the power of commitment, but you take control of it and you learn to use it to get and have it be anything you like. But all I need is for somebody to say, I'm committed to being happier, uh, more successful and fulfilled. I'm committed, committed to, to being the, the best that I can be and reaching, realizing my full potential. If you have that kind of a commitment, then uh, I took all the things I've been doing for years in my coaching and said, I could put this in a program. I could put this in a training program that everyone could have access to. And although I won't be there physically to provide some of that one-on-one, -on -one, a big piece of what a coach does, as you all know, is what, what is why do you hire a weight, uh, like a fitness coach? Yeah, he tells you how to, you know, do your things. But what's the main reason for having that fitness coach? What's that? Push. Yeah, he pushes you and holds you. Accountable. Yeah, accountability. You know, if it's a running or a running partner, you know they're going to show up on your door at seven o'clock in the morning. Boom, boom, boom. You know, and, and you're like, oh no, 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 I'm not today, not today. Like what? I got up, I got out of bed, and I drove all the way over here. Get your butt out of here, and you go. Well. We decided that one of the ways we could do that is by putting you on teams where you hold each other. We call it gentle accountability. You don't kick each other's butt. You don't go, you loser, I can't believe you didn't do what you said. So we have these teams of six people, and there's a leader and a co-leader, and they take you through this training. Much of it is the foundational work that I do with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, but you have access to it, and there are certain things that will come about as you're doing the training. So let's start with this. How many of you had a chance to, to peek at the, the website? Yep. Yes, beautiful. And I don't know, saw it, see the video. Even if it was just the video, and you get a, you know, a very, did your hand go up there, Kale? Yep, it Oh, did. that's great, because I was <laughs> looking around. I didn't notice, so thanks for that. So you, you, the first question is, what do you want? And you can take that in so many ways. You know, what do you want? You're here because because Cameron told you to be here. But is there any chance that after you just read a little bit on the site that you started asking, well, if I could have some of that, if I could have more of whatever it is that's missing from your life, less of the things you don't want, did you did you have? I saw you nodding. Did 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 you have anybody have anything that they you know want to throw out there? Well, here's some things that I I think these are things I want. That I'd love to have. If I could have anything, limitless. You know? Success. Yeah, success. And interesting. What does success mean? Seeing people say you're a success coach. You know, I, well, that's something different, right? For everyone. Yeah. For a for a, a stay-at-home mom, it's different than for a billionaire. They've got different missions. Success is basically having a life that's happy and fulfilled. It's a life of meaning and purpose. A life that you can live and die without regrets. Isn't that success? So yeah, what were you gonna say, Adam? Oh. I was just, what stuck out to me in the video is that knowledge is not power, essentially what you're doing with it. And I just remember there was a phase I think about a year ago where I was doing a book a month for about two and a half years straight. But nothing in my life changed. Yeah. And uh, it, it just made me realize that it's, it's more about what you do with the information you're given and being consistent with it. Yeah. It's everything. It's it's, uh, in, in fact, theoretically, the, the material in Life Mastery, it's, it's, I've been doing this for 40 years, and it's the culmination of every insight that I'd ever read or studied or come up with my, on my own, tested and tried, and all put into this one thing where I thought, you know, if you do it right, you don't need 50 books, you're at 500 or 5,000, 20 seminars. You could just take, if, what if there was enough stuff in one where if you could just master 10% of it, you'd be the most empowered, most enlightened person you know. What would that be like? If, and that's just 10%. And so that became the goal, was to create a system that would guarantee that it isn't just information. Now what are you going to do with it? So today, this, this week, session one, we're going to learn about this. And now you've got these exercises that will help you understand it. And then you have these daily practices where you apply it to your life. It's OK. Do what you need. Just whisper. Just tiptoe. <laughs> and so you get to basically say, all right, so I get this, and that would make sense, and yeah, if I did that every single day, my life would probably be better. And if I did it every day for a week, three weeks, 
six months. At some point, I wouldn't have to think anymore. It'd just be who I am. You, any of you remember the first time you ever drove a car? You know, and it was like, ah, and every single turn and every little detail, it was like exhausting. You know, you get out for the first driver's test and you're sweating because there's so much for you to think about and do and your brain's like trying to keep up with it. I, I remember my driver's training coach. Uh, instructor. He was the head football coach, big, burly, monstrous guy. And there's all the kids in the back, and we're driving. And he's and there's this pothole. It's like this wide and this deep. And he goes, "Don't hit that pothole." <laughs> what? <laughs> I went right into it because we see what we're looking for, and we head in the direction that we're looking. And most of us are looking in a direction that doesn't serve us or give us the kind of power and freedom we want. And then he proceeded to hit me so hard about dislocating my jaw. This is back in the days when they were allowed, were allowed to do that. And threw me out of the car and drove off and left me standing there. 16-year-old crying. So I have no idea why I just told Oh, yeah. So anyhow. But now you can drive the car with moms. The dads too. You could drive the car, change your kids' diapers in the back seat, and text all at the same time without thinking. Because yeah, it's just become who we are. I'm not saying you should, by the way, <laughs> but our brain takes over. That's how we accomplish so much. It gets to a point where we can do almost anything subconsciously without thinking. That's what we do. It's conditioning. The idea of replacing the negative conditioning in your in your life with the positive conditioning, and. If you think you don't have any ne negative conditioning, boy, look around at all the people who you know who do. Well, they look at you the same way. <laughs> We've all got it. See, the crazy thing is the conditioning that determines everything we think, feel, and do. Everything. But we didn't create it. It was just given to us. We are born with it. And it decided what our lives would be like and who we'd be and what kind of people we'd be and victims and all those things. But what if you could actually identify with all the things that cause you pain and suffering, hold you back, and replace it with the opposite? What would it look like? And this applies to both your personal life as well as your career. In every area, you, you have the, the ability to create, and, and that conditioning is made up of five things. Your perceptions, how you see the world around you. Would you agree that there's more than one way to look at something? Uh, in fact, and it's kind of a bit of, you know, perception, reality. Um, Einstein, he, they said, what's the definition of reality? One of his descriptions was, um, well, if you put, a, if, if you put, if you put a, a young man on a hot stove, a second will seem like an hour. But sitting next to a pretty girl, and an hour will seem like a second. Because that's reality. Well, that's actually, truth is, we're all having a different reality this very moment. Uh, you sit next to somebody on a roller coaster, somebody who hates roller coasters and somebody who loves them. Two very opposite experiences. One will last forever and one will seem to last 30 seconds. So even time is relative. Everything. So what if you could take control of your perceptions? Stop seeing things that cause you pain and suffering, that limit you, that hold you back. And start seeing things in, in a way that give you this amazing power and so on and so forth. Same thing with belief. Our beliefs control how what we think, say, and do. And if you want to know how powerful is belief, take a bunch of kids, convince them that Americans are actually truly evil. The devil spawn and they're going to destroy the world. And if you can stop these horrible evil people by crashing your airplane into one of their buildings and eventually destroy the whole country that you will not only save the world but you'll be rewarded in heaven for for an eternity and, and they believe you what would, what would they do they get up and they crash a plane into a building not give a thought they'd be smiling all the way there like wow i'm saving the world that's a belief if you believe that you could jump off the highest building in the world and you float to the bottom get a billion dollars in the cure for cancer you'd rush and jump off the only thing that keeps you from doing it is you don't believe so what if you could find all the beliefs you have that hold you back and cause you pain and suffering and keep you from being your greatest possibility? And you could replace them with beliefs of the opposite nature. And you could say, so you're just telling us that perceptions and beliefs, these are all these stories in our head, right? 
And you're saying just take and replace the bad stories with stories that make my life feel better and make me better? Well, you're telling me to live in a fantasy world. You already do. <laughs> That's the big joke. You right now, your life is nothing but stories and beliefs that have been passed on to you and perceptions of reality that you have simply grabbed onto and accepted as being true and you look for proof and you find it because we see what we're looking for just like I saw that pothole and I drove right into it, right? And so the difference is you're living in this fantasy that you created but you don't know it's a fantasy. So what if we could prove to you that it was a fantasy? And there you went through a program and it showed you example after example and gave you exercises or assignments and you went out and you tested it. And at the end of the week you said, holy cow, this isn't real and that's not real. All these things that all my life, I've always assumed that that guy didn't like me because of the way he talks to me or treats me and so on. It turns out he's got Asperger's and he doesn't know how to express himself. I was just thought he was bored with me. And, 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 and at some point you start going, I have all these stories that weren't true. Oh my gosh, my life is actually a re it's truly a fantasy. And so we say, yeah, you can't, you can't escape it. See, and this is something even Einstein proved. Uh, we cannot see reality for what it is. We're not capable of it. We have a filter. And this filter, everything that, come, that happens goes through the filter, and the filter says this is good or this is bad, this is okay or it's not okay. And it does it based on comparing it to other things in our life, based on the things that we've had happened to us in the past, the things we've been told. And so I could say to you right now, I don't have any problems. And your filter would say, oh, this is the BS filter. <laughs> That's bull crap. Everybody has problems. That's bull, 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 right? But if I remove that filter completely, and you had simply no filter at all, you would say, well, really, tell me what that means. Because now you don't have a, you haven't decided that it means anything. And I'd say it means this. Something happened, boom, it hits my filter that says, oh, that's a problem. And then I look at it and go, oh man, what am I gonna do? This is terrible, it's destroyed my day. Well, what if I don't have a problem filter? Then it's something just happens. And I go, oh, something happened. But I haven't called it a problem yet. I haven't been programmed or conditioned to say, that's a problem. It's just what is, rain, good or bad? Rain, is rain good or bad? Oh, she says it's good. Well, you're in Arizona. <laughs> Everybody's gonna say good. Well, bad question. Bad. You say I'm bad. from Chicago. Yeah. Everybody yeah. says bad. Right? Yeah. It's bad for business. <laughs> bad for business. It's whatever you say it is. That's right, good for you, bad for business. Truth is, if you're a farmer, it's good. If you're going on a picnic or you're having your daughter's wedding out in the backyard, it's bad, relative. Everything. What if every single thing in life are bad? That's what uh, Shakespeare wrote. Nothing is good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. He meant that filter. We decide what it is. We decide if it's okay or not. What if you had a filter that said, uh, you, I call it, the, that's great filter. A filter that's job was to say, uh, we, we teach this in leadership. A, a really good leader will do everything possible to avoid having things go wrong, uh, avoid catastrophes, right? Wouldn't a good leader try to avoid catastrophes? A great leader capitalizes on them. A great leader says, awesome, something amazing is coming out of this. It sounds like a cliche, you know, the, the, the silver lining to the cloud. But a lot of cliches became that way because they're true. And they've been true for thousands of years. We just stopped listening to them and stopped applying them. But what if you got to a place in your life where you actually always automatically assume that no matter what it was, it was great. You're, you had a filter that just said, well, that's great. And you, and you asked the question, the most powerful question you can ask is, well, what's great about this? What would that be like? If you just, no matter what it was, a customer, anybody here deal with any upset customers ever? <laughs> anybody ever have, like your equipment doesn't show up on time or the person, the people aren't there on time, things go, what if you automatically have this filter that says, well, this is great. And now I get to figure out what's great about it. And it automatically jumped from that whatever happened to, okay, something great is happening here. And now if you look back at your life, all the most amazing things that have ever happened to you, all the things that you're the proud of, proudest of, almost every one of them started out as a problem. 
something that was a pain in the butt, something that was a challenge, something that you overcame, and as a result of either dealing with it or overcoming it, you became someone else. You ended up with this great thing that you're now proud of. Whether it was running a marathon, which, you know, starts out, you know, that's 26 miles of marathon. But is it 26.2, the numbers that they put on the back of their car? You've seen them, right? The 26.2, two, 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 that means they ran a marathon. I saw one that went by the other day. Is it 26.2.4? Two, yes, no, I think it's 26.2. 26.2. I, I saw one go by the other day and it's 0. 0.0. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So I just said that. Uh, I hear you, brother. <laughs> so, but what if? That's great. You just, yeah. If you, it, but you got so good at it that you didn't even have to think. You were the bright spot in the room. You're the one who automatically, when everything happened, everybody turns to you. Because they know that you're going to find something. Now that's real leadership, right? I mean, these are the people that, who do we look for? The ones who are going to go, oh no, what a disaster. Oh, look what happened for me. Why, why does this always happen to me? And um, uh, Helen Keller, and I love that she wrote this, she was blind, and she's writing about shadows. What, how do you even know what a shadow is when you're blind, right? But she wrote, you cannot see your shadows while facing toward the sun. And so she didn't suffer the way most people suffer because she re refused to focus on those things. And I love to call it focus because, and I'm just giving you a little snippet, so that just whatever flies in my head. I don't have any notes here. These are just little pieces from the course. And I'd love to show you that one of the, these five things, so we talked about belief and about, uh, about perception and how you can take control of those, one of them is focus. Focus is deciding what kind of a life you're having right here and right now. What are you focused on? If you go to that picnic, the one where it's going to get rained out, but the rain's not coming for two hours, and you focus on the picnic, I mean, on the rainstorm that's coming, you're going to have a hard time. You're not going to want to really put all the games and toys out or get out the food. Like, we're going to have to turn and get back in the car anyhow. And, and it ruins the whole thing because you're focused on the storm in the distance. But what, a, what would a four-year-old be focused on? Just have fun. Yeah, that butterfly. <laughs> ah, no, they don't care. And they're going to have the time of their life because they focused on this being here right here and right now. And so you can do that. You And you can only focus on one thing at a time. So when you're focusing on something wonderful, you can't see the rest of it. Put your hand out right now. Look at, look at the back of your hand, everybody. Just focus, really focus on the back of your hand. Okay, you see it? Look at the lines, look at the veins. Look at everything you can think of. Okay, now put your hand down. Where was the shadow being thrown by your hand? Where did it land? Did you see it? There's always, there's always one. Well said, well done. He did have that bright piece of white paper. Yeah. I have to say, and don't hold your hand over a bright piece of white paper under the light. <laughs> That's good. So, and there is an exception to every rule. We teach that. But for the most part, you're so focused on this, you can't see the shadow because of that focus thing. So imagine if you could take control of your focus and learn to be totally present right here, right this minute. My phone is, is off, right this second. You're the most important people in the world to me, right this moment. Nobody else and nothing else matters. And imagine living your life like that when you're in front of, whether it's a customer, and this customer, all that matters is you. We're only gonna to be together for the next seven minutes, but you own me, you know, body, mind, and spirit. And my goal is to not only help you resolve your issue, but leave you feeling better than you felt all day, maybe all week. How many ways can I contribute to you in this next five minutes? What could I be doing? And the same thing when you're with your kids. It's, believe me, it's quality over quantity. Who could I be? How many of you multitask? Come on, come on, come on, put your hand. How many of you multitask? All right. We're pretty proud of our abilities to multitask. Most of us. But guess what the studies show? Does everybody have a piece of paper? I'm gonna get you one. You have one? Great. Everybody get out a piece of paper. You don't need to. You've already done it. Have you done it? You've done it. That's right. Okay. Um, make sure there's a little bit of room on it. Okay. Yeah, that, that'll be perfect. Uh, okay. And um, do you all have your phones with you? No. No? Okay. You were my focus. <laughs> That's great. Oh, wait a minute. I'm taping with this. <laughs> all right. Do we have a clock? Is there a, is there a time piece anywhere up where people can see it? 
because it'll, it'll be really helpful. So you have your, your phone, so that's great. There's one clock, so you have yours. You, uh, Cameron, you won't need yours, so we can loan it. You don't have your phone with you? Okay, so we're gonna, do you know how to put it on the stopwatch? This, the timer? And Clyde, you don't need yours. Could you put it on your, huh? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, what do you need? Oh, she needs to use it for a stopwatch. Yeah. He's gonna be my stopwatch. Oh, okay, great, great. Okay, I want you, so your stopwatch is all lined up? Okay. So I'm gonna show you something. You're, are you all set up there? Kayla? She's, she's having some connection I so. issues. I can't, see, I can't see anything, but I can hear you. Okay, so phone. get your paper out and get your, wa your stopwatch ready. So, okay, this is about multitasking and you're gonna to get to learn something really interesting. When I say go, I want you to do the following. I want you to write the number one and then the letter A. Number two, letter B, go all the way down to number 26 and Z. Ready, and time yourself. Start your timer, and go. One, A, two, B, three, C. And then stop your stopper when you're done. Okay. All right. So let's just go around. Let's get let's get some time. So how was yours? Forty three. That's pretty fast. Fifty one. That's pretty typical. Forty six. Quicker. Thirty seven. Oh my gosh, we've got a speedster. It's flash. You made wow. 47. <laughs> All right. What's that? It's 34. Right. Okay. Well, what, what was yours, Kayla? 34 seconds. 34. Holy wow. moly. Wow. She's known for flying. Now, you weren't, to, <laughs> you weren't supposed to use your typewriter. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Requeue your stopwatches. Get them back to zero. Let me know when you're ready. Everybody set? Okay, we're gonna do it again, but this time instead of multitasking, switching back and forth between tasks, you're gonna write, write one through 26, and then you're gonna write A through Z. One, two, three, set, whenever you're ready, go. Start your, start, your timer. Is everybody set? All right, so how are you this time? 32. What was it the first time? 43. From 43 to 32. Whoa, how about you? 34. From 51 to 34. 46 to 27. Wow, half. 37 to 30. Really? <laughs> you just messed up. <laughs> you, you can go now. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. At least it wasn't more. Right. You can keep multitasking, it doesn't make a difference. Go ahead. 4733. 4733, yeah. So obviously. Oh yeah, Kayla. I went from 34 to 31. Okay, little minor change. So in the end, if we did a hundred people, you'd find that 90% of them would be, you know, 40% to 50% less. And so what's happening is this. This is where we went wrong when it comes to multitasking. You can talk on the phone and do the dishes because they use two different parts of your brain. Mow the lawn and do the dishes. I mean, part, no, mow the lawn and talk on the phone. <laughs> you, can, you can use the certain parts of your brain that don't require the prefrontal cortex, 
and, and then your thought center. You can do that at the same time, but what you cannot do is you cannot use the prefrontal frontal cortex for two distinct operations. What happens is you think you're doing it, but it's not. The brain's going back and forth, back and forth, and you're losing time and focus in between, and you're losing quality in between. And so once you get it, it doesn't take long to figure out which things you can do that are physical, walk and talk at the same time. But if you think that you can have quality relationships, be with your family, your kids, your client, with another human being, have a quality time with them while you're figuring something out or while you're talking to someone else, while you're texting, while texting one person, while you're talking to somebody else, it's no, you're going back and forth and they've proven that you are losing. You're losing productivity, effectiveness, and you're not being present for either one of them. And so if you had 10 minutes to spend with your kids, what they found, spend five minutes with this one and five minutes with this one, they will get double, twice as much out of if you spend, unless it's something that they're doing together, obviously, twice as much out of it as if you spend the 10 minutes with both of them trying to juggle their you know, various, but same thing, of course, again, with your clients, coaches, if you've got people under you and you're, they've got their, their issues. Uh, so this goes back to this idea of focus. Multitasking comes back to focus. If you can focus, be here in this moment, 100%, then you end up having more power and control over your life and a more fulfilling and meaningful life. And so what if that became a habit? What if you could just do that automatically? You just became this super focused person who questioned your belief system, questioned your perceptions, and so on. So these are three of the things. The other two are, of course, your habits. Well, that's part of the biggest part, probably, of our whole life mastery is we, we, we share these insights with you. And, of course, there's hundreds of them. So you don't have to master them all. Ten of them will change your life forever. But then we say, now we're going to make it a part of who you are. I call it permalearn. And it's a process uh, between spaced repetition, where you will tell you about it again next week, and the week after, and the week after, a little differently this time. And we'll give you a different example, and you'll play a different game, but you're going to get this over and over a course of time. We also have you turn around and share it with others. Because they found, see, when you are exposed to a new idea, like right now in this room, your brain is exposed to, in some cases, millions of new bits of information every day. It doesn't know what to do with it. So you, it waits until you fall asleep. Anybody wondering why we sleep at night, in addition to, that's when we, our body heals, we produce uh, growth hormone. It also is when your brain looks at everything that's happened and decides what to keep and what to let go of. All the new, all those bits of information. So you know how it decides which information to keep? One of the ways it does it is it asks, well, did you share it with anyone? If you shared it with someone, it says, well, then it must be important. And this can go all the way back to the, the caveman days when they're sharing, you know, the lessons that they learned and the, and the bear that almost ate them and they stand up in front of the fire and they said, okay, watch out for this big brown thing. He's really mean and he's fast and he climbs trees. And you need to know this because, so it makes sense that our brains would evolve to want to keep things that we share. And so it's decided it's important. So we build it in where you actually learn it, and turn around and share it. Um, apply it. If you do something, especially if you learn something today, and you say, you know what, I'd like to remember that one, then make sure you don't go to bed tonight until you've actually done it. Your brain will say, hey, I used it. I put it to use. It must be important. And so again, it moves into another part of your brain. And then, as I mentioned, the space repetition. So over a space period of time, not 500 times in the next five minutes, but over the course of months, you hear a little more and a little bit more, then at some point your brain goes, well, this stuff must be important because I keep running into it. So there are things like that. Obviously, there's you know, there's many other things, but those things uh, people can usually grasp very quickly and how they master it. So this is how we build habits, but we don't get rid of habits. We replace them. That's why we, I call it replace negative conditioning with positive conditioning. You're in control at all times because as you go through the training, you get to say, see something. You might see something go, you know, that doesn't really apply to me. Fine. You're going to get 10 lessons today. And so, you know, there's one. Oh, but this one, oh, I could use this one right now. And what else is great is that over the course of time, one lesson may be more important to you than another one. 
something, if you're going through a divorce, there'll be certain lessons that you need to learn that, are, that you're going to go through that and go, oh my gosh, I needed this desperately. And then the divorce is over and you go, yeah, no, that really came in handy, but I'm good. I don't really need that part right now. And so the goal is you take what you need and then you make it a part of who you are. And, the, and habit's just another word for mastery. So it's just something that comes automatically. And that's the biggest goal of all. And so the fifth element of this conditioning that decides everything you think, feel, and do is environment. And your environment includes not only where you work and where you live, but the people you're with. Whether they're toxic, whether they're enlightened, whether they're bright spots, whether they're happy and cheerful and positive and optimistic or the other ones. It includes that, which is one of the reasons why we're here today. Because as Cameron began learning the whole process and seeing the power of environment, thank you, uh, he started realizing, well, I want my environment, I want to be surrounded by, by, well, let's put it this way, we all know what a victim is. A victim is somebody who says, oh, this sucks and, it's, and there's nothing I can do about it. This sucks and it's not my fault. And it's basically somebody who doesn't have power. But there's the opposite of that as a person. You could still say this sucks, but you could say this sucks. And let's fix it. Let's find a solution. Let's see what we can do. And, and, and. And so those are called heroes. And that's the difference is a hero still sees the problem just like a victim. But they say, well, we're going to do something about it. I'm not going to let it be a problem. But we think heroes are Spider-Man. You know, we, why can't they be me or you? You know, heroes, that person sitting next to you who actually gets up and says, hey, would you like to take my seat? look like you look nine months pregnant it's okay I I could use the exercise it, it takes nothing but that quick little decision for anybody at all times we all get to be a hero well what if you're surrounded by heroes what if you're surrounded by people who are saying that's great that's great and all these things we're talking about who are committed to being the bright spot to finding solutions to helping the people around them feel the best that they can be and be and so on and that's where we created Life Mastery and said, what if we brought this into the corporate environment? And everybody in the company had access to this. And they got to practice on each other. And they got to do their assignments all week. And uh, if your assignment, for instance, is uh, express your appreciation. For one week, I want you to do two things. One, I want you to think about every time you think something positive about someone. Every single time. Step one, be aware of the times you think something positive about someone. Part two is you can't think it without sharing it. If the person's not in the room, share it with someone else. I think so-and-so is awesome. I love how she does this. If they're standing in front of you, 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 you share it. Now, some people can feel a little embarrassed at first. Well, I don't you know, want them to think this or that. Yeah, but if you're all doing it, then you're aware of it. You cannot say something you don't mean. It's got to be sincere. But if you notice somebody and you notice that Cam just got an awesome haircut. <laughs> I did notice. We did. Time to see his hair. <laughs> you smile and you just say, hey, man, I love your haircut, Cam. Yeah, I love your size large shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, and look, everybody's smiling, just making jokes about it. You want to know why it's so important to share when we think or see something positive? Do you know why it's so important? You take guesses. Endorphins. Pardon? Raids endorphins in there. Yes! In interesting. You are the one who benefits first. Because you're thinking something positive. Your brain pumps out all these positive neurochemicals. Every it's like the person who says, you know, um, oh, I, I'm miserable because I have such a bad marriage. My husband doesn't love me. I don't feel loved. Well, you can't feel someone else's love. That's, that's a chemical action. You can feel only the love that you have. That's the only love you can literally feel. And it's your chemical action. You want to feel love? Then find somebody that you can feel love for. And as you love them, as you think about that person and how much you appreciate and love them, boom, all come out the chemicals. And you get to be happy. Now the fact that you share it with the other person, well now they get to feel one of their great needs met. I'll share that. How, how much time do we have? Okay, I'll share one more thing, then we'll just kind of go to open floor. I don't hear that question. I told her to be short. Yeah, so I'll try to rush this up. So I'll finish this one last thing. Rush. 
Yeah, I know. I can't rush it. I you can't rush it's it. It's just, I mean, actually, <laughs> everything comes. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All Try. right. Try. So, yeah, so, so, I, so this would be an assignment, a, a, a practice this week. Everyone in this room, I would love to have you. Every time you think is, I love your smile, Clyde. No, really, you have a smile that just, when I see your smile, it just makes me just feel totally loved and appreciated. <laughs> it doesn't, you just have the most real, engaging, genuine smile you ever saw. And, I, and so I was literally thinking it. Now in our normal culture, I would have just thought it. I wouldn't have said something. So I just said it. And I got a hug out of it. And it's like, wow, what could we do? What kind of difference could we make? If we were, and now here's something great. Look for it. You see, when people say, so you want me to tell people, say nice things to people. Well, what if there isn't anything? Oh, there is. You just have to look a little harder for some people. But even jerks have best friends. Even a jerk has somebody who thinks he's awesome. <laughs> So you just look a little bit, you look a little harder. Now, would this come in handy if you were on the phone with an upset client or you're dealing with somebody who's like not in a great place? I had a, uh, a flight attendant uh, and she was having the worst day of her life and you could tell and she was miserable and she's slamming things around in the, in the galley and just no smiles and just like sloshing water when she's putting them there. And I thought this woman is definitely in need. A little something extra. <laughs> Don't coffee tear me. I wasn't going there. You guys, come on. <laughs> so I literally made it my mission to find something that I could do to contribute to her, some way. And I waited for her to accidentally do something right. And I made a big deal out of it. And I smiled, and when she'd bring me something, I started ordering things just so I could get eye contact and smile. Literally, I know. It's like, can I have just one more glass of water? And she's bringing me, and but I didn't, you know, I didn't preach. I didn't do any, you know, any coaching. Just smiled and made a couple of nice comments. As I'm getting off the phone, I mean, off the phone, off the plane, she grabs me and pulls me to the side and said, "Thank you. You saved my life." And I'm like, "What?" And I caught me off guard. She said, "My husband just left me for another woman," and. I found out five minutes before I got on the plane and I just wanted to die. And she said, and I felt like there's nothing left to live for. And you've proven to me that that's not true. And I got off the plane. It's like, you just don't know. You never know. You could change somebody's life like that by just making that little extra effort. But one thing we do know is when I asked you when we first got here and I said, why are you here? What do you want? You know, well, yeah, we're here because we, they told us to come here, but, well, y'all want something. And you could say, well, I want to be happy, or I want this, or I want to be this and this and this. Well, underneath it all, something occurred to me years ago. We all want something that very few of us understand, and it's this. How many of you have kids? Hands? You should be putting them all up. <laughs> all in. So we all have kids? Okay. When you teach your kids and they're very little, what's one of the first things you teach them? One thing is, it's not okay to play in the street. It's not okay to chase balls in the street. It's not okay to run with knives and scissors. It's not okay to cut your little sister's hair off. It's not okay to put your hand on the stove, right? We tell them what's not okay before we tell them what is okay because first, our first goal is to protect them. And so for every one thing we say, oh, that's good, we say like 10 things, that's not okay. And that's how we train our children, and that's how our parents trained us. That's okay, that's not okay. And eventually, okay, not okay, good, bad. Somewhere in there, we use those words, right? It's like, good boy, bad boy, very bad. That's not okay, right? Well, all of us, every one of us, eventually get to a place where we don't hear that's okay or that's not okay. We hear, I'm good, I'm bad. I'm okay, I'm not okay. We personalize it. It's what we do. It's how we're made. Well, now it gets really scary. We've been told by our parents that it's not up to us. We don't let our kids decide if it's okay to play in the street, do we? No. Why? Because they may make bad decisions. We tell them it's not. No, no, no. You don't decide this. It's up to me. So we teach our children, as our parents taught us, it's not up to me if I'm okay. It's up to someone else. 
It's up to my parents. And so I start trying to figure out ways to get them to tell me I'm okay because that feels good. And keep them from saying I'm not okay because that feels bad, right? From the time we're two years old, three years old, we are conditioned to do things that will have someone else tell us if we're okay or not. And they have the permission to tell us whether or not we are. And then guess what happens? They go on a date and they bring grandma and grandpa home. And now it's up to them, right? And then a babysitter. And then you go to school and it's up to the teachers and the coaches until you grow up as an adult. And what have you learned? It's not just your parents. Everybody but you gets to decide if you're okay. The whole world, it's up to them. And my job is to get you to tell me that I'm okay because I'm conditioned to want to feel that good feeling. And so I spend my whole life trying to get you to tell me I'm okay. And you want to know some of the things that are wrong with that? You already do. One, if he says that I'm okay, well, he doesn't really know me. <laughs> Wait till he finds out what I'm really like. <laughs> He'll change his mind. If he thinks I'm okay for something I just did, well, that's just this one thing. Wait till the next time he sees me and I do something different. It's fleeting. It's either he thinks I'm okay because he doesn't know me, or he's just wrong, or he's, you know, a little crazy, or because of this one thing I did, but I might not get it right the next time. So even when they tell us we're okay, well, he might not say it. Just because he does doesn't mean he will. So it doesn't last. It's just this one moment, I'm okay, but uh, everybody else doesn't say that. And so now I need the whole world to tell me I'm okay, always, all the time. Are they going to do that? No. No, we're screwed. But the worst part is we don't believe them anyhow. It's only for a minute we don't believe it. And we never will. There's only one way any one of us will ever get what we really want. Truly, deeply want. What is it? That's the day that you learn that nobody's opinion matters but yours. It's okay to respect their opinion, to admire, to listen to them, to care for them to be aware of their opinion. But when it comes to their opinion of you, no one's opinion matters but yours. And it never will. And the day you can look in the mirror and say, I'm okay, I'm okay. Yeah, I totally screwed that thing up and I'm okay. Yeah, I bought way too much of that and I'm okay. Yeah, I cut my hair too short and I'm okay. Yeah, 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 I'm not perfect and I'm okay because I'm not supposed to be perfect. You know how I know that none of us are supposed to be perfect? There's eight billion people on the planet. Do you know anyone that's perfect? If we were supposed to be perfect, wouldn't there be a few of them? <laughs> at least a couple, right? So I like to look at it like, you know, let's just say that there is a God. And so we're like, you know, amazing. We're miracles, you know. God created these miracles. And we can do pretty amazing things. If you compare us to like, you know, a, a frog or something, we're pretty amazing, right? And maybe even miracles. But we're a mess. So we're all messy miracles or miraculous messes. And what if you could be okay with that? Yeah, I'm a miraculous mess. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay. Because if I were perfect, nobody would want to be near me because I'd make them all sick and they couldn't relate to me and I'd be all frustrated with them if I really were perfect. Anybody here ever bake cookies? Hands? Somebody bake? Yeah, I love it. The guy's hands went up. You never baked a cookie? Only the guys? How fun. Okay, well, one thing we know for sure. What makes cookies so good? It starts with an S. Sugar. Sugar! Cookies are supposed to be sweet, right? So why do we put salt in them? It's because without the salt, they're too sweet. We need the salt. It actually makes the cookie taste better. It's counterintuitive. But that one thing, that little bit of something that's not supposed to be there, that's not perfect, that's not sweet, actually makes the cookie taste better. It makes us enjoy it more. Well, guess what? Those things about you that aren't perfect, that's the salt. That's the thing that makes you so that you're more interesting. Savory, they call it. That's the thing that makes it so that people don't get sick of you because there is something that's not perfect about you and they can relate to you. And so what if you could say, yeah, I got a little bit of salt, sometimes a little too much, maybe, I don't know. I'm a messy miracle and I'm okay. Imagine, what if that became who you are? And you got it. And what if you understood that every single person in this room and every person in your life and every person who walks in front of you, every single client who walks up to you, no matter what's coming out of their mouth, what they're actually saying is, am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? Can you tell me I'm okay? I had uh, Cameron uh, uh, 
I told him about when he sends all the drivers out to do their runs. I said, you wouldn't send a truck out with an empty tank, would you? To drive to Flagstaff, to do, drop something off? Well, no, of course not. You'd fill the tank up, right? First you fill the tank up. Do that with every person you know. They're waiting, they're all driving around with empty tanks. Fill it up. How do you fill it up? I love your smile, man. <laughs> I love your haircut. I love, your haircut. I love how observant you were with that shadow. <laughs> you know, it's, wow. There's something wonderful. Share it, help them, until they become the person like you're becoming, who says to themselves in the mirror, I'm a messy miracle and I'm okay. See, they're not, they're, they're not there yet. They're not ready to learn that lesson and it'll be a while before you master it. So you'll still need to know, am I okay? If they pull up in a beautiful brand new car and they take their time getting out, just, you know, oh wait, I'll be right there. Hey, how you doing? They're waving to you from the parking lot so you'll look over. Oh, is that a new car? Oh, why, yes it is. <laughs> I must be okay. I must be. Nice car. Yep, there it is. <laughs> and then somebody pulls up next to you in your your B, your your BMW your your 300 Beamer, and they pull up in a 700. They go, hey, oh, got okay. a nice little speed bump yes, you I'm got okay. there, buddy. <laughs> I'm not okay. I'm okay. So one day, imagine that you master it and you get it. I'm okay, and you and your your whole life will change. Everything you do, what you do, why you do it, and how you do it will change because you've changed your whole purpose and your whole motive and what's behind it. But imagine how amazing you'd be with other people if you simply got that. To just ask him, am I okay? This customer who's just so upset that nobody showed up and nobody returned my call and everybody's ignoring me. It must be because I'm not okay. They don't respect me. I'm not important. I don't matter. And you say, wow, that's not okay. You are, you're, you are so important to me. I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. We're going to fix this. And how can I make this up to you? Because you just seem like such an awesome person and I don't want you to have a bad day on our account. Let's see what we can do. What they're hearing is that you're going to fix this problem. What they're hearing is I'm okay. The problem is secondary. Yeah, they want their cooler, they, they want their filter fixed. But mostly they want to know that they're okay. That's why they're really upset. The filter is just an inconvenience. It may have been spoiled the party, but more than anything, that driving force is if you treat them with respect and tell them you're okay, we're going to take care of you. I, have you ever had somebody give you bad news, but they do it in such a way that you don't mind? It's like, you just need to know, you are our number one priority. I really care about you, I'm gonna take care of you. Whatever it takes, this thing hasn't shown up yet, and if I have to stay up till midnight, we're gonna to get to the bottom of this, because you're, you, you're important to me. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine, we'll just move the party, because you've answered that question. So, so this is a tiny little snippet of what happened when, when I had the chance to create Life Mastery, which by the way, I have written the first time, I've been doing this for 40 years, I wrote that 30 years ago, and I rewrite it every year for 30 years, so you can imagine how, how closely we've gotten it to throwing out the crap and keeping the things that everybody says, oh yeah, that one really works. And what's beautiful about it is, it, you get together, you can do it on the phone, you can do it together in a team, you get together for a week, well, I mean for an hour, once a week, and you just talk about what you read that week. So here's the session, and we're gonna, so let's say we get together every Tuesday at 10 a.m. So just before you go to bed tonight, make sure you read next week's session so you have the whole week to practice it. If you wait till the last minute, you didn't get to practice. So read it before you go to bed and then spend the whole week doing it. And now next week we're gonna get together and we're gonna talk about it. So, oh, here's what I did with that, and here's the assignment, and this is what I did. And this is, you know, here's what I got out of it. And, and as you're sharing this between each other, you end up finding that, that you learn more, sometimes you learn more of a lesson from the person who shared their lesson. Well, here's what I did, and you're like, oh my God, oh, now I get it. And it helps drive it home, so the sharing helps drive it, and then the accountability, well, here's what I'm gonna take on this next week. So how did that thing go? You were gonna go do that, and it's like, oh yeah, I wanna make sure I have my story when I get there so I can share it. And after you go through it, here's how we've designed the program. It's not a course, it's a practice. How long do you think it takes to master something? Of course, we know the number, 10,000 hours is the magic number, whatever that might be. And of course, now they know it varies, and it depends on all sorts of things. Well, so this is something like Tai Chi. How long do you take Tai Chi? For a week, for three months? What? A whole life. A whole life, it's a practice. So they say, well, how long do you want me to practice mastering my life? 
what does mastering my life mean? I mean, geez, wouldn't that be, if you had to master something, wouldn't that be a cool thing to master, right? So how long should it take you to master your life? You know, especially what if there's hundreds of things that you could master? So we designed it so that you can do this for the rest of your life. So it's a, it's, it's a three month curriculum that's designed so that at the end of the three months, each of our participants, they then become, so we have a leader, a team, a team leader, a co-leader, and six participants. At the end of the three months, this leader falls off, the co-leader now becomes a leader, and the participants each become a co-leader of their own team. Now there's not a lot for you to have to worry about because the curriculum's there. It's just that you help the leader engage the group. Keep them all engaged. Hey, well, who else wants to share? And what did you learn? And, oh, here's what I learned this week. So they're still involved. And if somebody's stuck and nobody has a story to share, well, they've got a story. They always come with a story. Well, here's what I did. Well, the first time I went through, here's what I got. But here's what I tried this week. And what happens is everyone, there's no exception, everyone who goes to the next level and says, so I'm going to be a co-leader this next time, they all say I got at least twice as much out of the course the second time as I did the first. So many things slipped by me the first time that I didn't even see because I was only looking for one thing or another. And oh my gosh, it's like, Mark, did you completely rewrite the course? No, we only changed chapter three. Wow, where'd all that new stuff come from? The course didn't change, you did. And then after you've done that and you've gone through another three, so now you've got it on a deeper level, then you move up, now you're the leader, and one of your team people becomes the co-leader and all the folks show up. Again, this whole time you've been already learning the material and it's not like you have to teach. You're just there saying, hi, everybody get on the call and making sure that they share and that somebody has something to share and you, of course, are sharing your best stories to help them understand more clearly what it is that they're trying to learn and master. And you can literally do that from that point on. You can just keep being the leader. And, and so we go from the top of the company and all the way down through the company until we're all, all the way, everybody in the company's gone through, and then we take the families through. And they get to take it home. And this is how the process works. And you can do it for as long as you want to do it. Of course, for as long as you're a part of uh, Camp's company, the goal is to make it a part of what he has to offer. And what we found in the past, we were voted this program at Boeing, in fact, it started with Boeing, right there at the, uh, the plant up on uh, McKellips, or Val Vista. Yeah, we actually started with them at that plant because they had merged with uh, McDonnell Douglas and we have massive issues because of the different cultures. So they brought us in and said, maybe you can get them all on the same page. And we used this and all, it, then it spread out. 200 employees at the time of Boeing, it was voted the number one employee uh, support tool and training program in the country, in the company. So the, the goal, and this is something that, that a commitment I've made to Cameron is that once the folks get the hang of this and they start realizing that, wow, you know, a paycheck's great, don't worry, you're gonna, you won't get paid any less, hopefully more because you'll be producing more and be more effective in everything you do. But the goal being, <laughs> Jim was like going, shut up, shut up, like enough for the money, enough for the money. <laughs> That wasn't, we, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> well, of course, our goal is to have you all elevated in everything you do. Be better, do better, and so on. So, but the goal is to have you at some point say, this is the most, this is why I'm here. The money's good, the company's great, but it's because of what I'm learning, the program and the people. I'm surrounded by enlightened, empowered human beings who are all up to the same thing, all playing this amazing game that we call life mastery. And so, I said, Cam, invite a few folks, because the first one we roll out is going to be me, and I'm going to bring two of my co-leaders, and they'll split it out as the teams roll out. And I said, and bring some folks who, are, who you would like to see on the first team. And I said, bring, invite more than six just in case somebody can't make the timeline or whatever. So we've got five, six, seven, uh, six or seven. Anyhow, I said, we'll figure out. But whoever is on that first team, if you're not on the first team, well, you'd be on the second one. Because, you know, right after the first one gets through its first three months, and we go out to the next wave, and then we go from six people to 36 people, and until we're, we're through the company. So, now, questions, thoughts? It could be questions about the program or how it works. 
and it could be just questions about your life, questions about things that maybe you, you'd be able to, you'd know the answers to if you were going through the, the training. So yeah, so we so we figure out depending on the team, it's a joint effort. We find a time, and this one will be over the phone, but you guys will be able to get together anytime you want because I'm out of state and my two trainers are out of state, and so we'll get together on a call for one hour once a week. We'll pick the day and the time that everybody agrees to, and then you can do it from anywhere, from here, from home, from wherever you are. And you just get on a call. We just all go around and share. And you know, the experience is made so that anybody, even an introvert, somebody who's afraid to ever open their mouth in front of anybody, they end up loving it, saying, oh, no, I finally found a safe place where I can be vulnerable and share and feel supported. And so it's, you know, it's definitely just not, it's not intimidating. There's nobody ever gets in someone's face that just never happens. And because once you've gone through it and you see how I lead, because I'm going to lead this, uh, this first team, um, and once you see how we do it, then as you move up, you'll be like, oh, no, I know what to do. Even how to gently, if somebody's taken over and they're supposed to be sharing for five minutes and they're ready to go for five hours. <laughs> and so you even learn the trick. It's real simple. You go, this is awesome stuff. I love it. Uh, we want to make sure everybody gets a chance to share. How about if we stop at this point, finish everyone else, and then if we have time left, we'll come back and we can finish up. Boom. And they don't feel like they've been dissed and they may get a chance to finish sharing. But that way, you know, so we even learn those little things. But it's, I mean, we've been doing this for a long, long time. So, you know, you're going to, I can promise you the bugs have been worked out. All that we need are people to say, hey, man, I've got an hour. If you think, you, you know, on 168 hours in a week, if you've got something that could rock my world and change my life and help me be happier and more fulfilled in every area, you know, hey. And, you know, and it's a great screening process because if somebody says, no, I'll pass, well, they weren't ready probably anyhow because it does take that commitment, right? you got to say, no, I'm, if you, if you, you've got to be able to say, I'm, you know, I'll put an hour into this. That's worth it for me. Because most of the assignments, because you could say, yeah, but the assignments take time, you know, and there's all that. And I say, well, no, actually not. For instance, here's an assignment. Tell me how much more time this would take. I want you to go 24 hours without saying one negative thing. You can't do it. <laughs> if you could, it wouldn't take any more time, right? I want you to support you. So we do things that don't take more time. It doesn't make you do more. In some cases, it's, it saves you time. It'll make you have you do less. It's more about doing it differently. Find a different route to work tomorrow. Make, you know, if anything, it takes you two more minutes than the second route. But what if it saves you two minutes? So it's not a time-consuming issue. It's more about, do you want to do something cool? Do you want to take your life to another level? Other questions? Or, like I said, they can be personal. I, we can do a little Q&A, Q, Q a, a little question mark uh, format. We can, because that happens too on the calls where people will say, well, what do I do about this? And usually, by the time you've made it to leader status, you know the answer. And you're able to say, oh, well, Based on, because we use these universal principles, and they are universal. They're the kind of thing where I finish a seminar, and I'll have somebody come up and whisper, and they'll say, you're LDS, aren't you? And then the next person will come up, are you Buddhist? Are you Hindu? Because they're, we use the fundamental universal principles that every major religion and culture are based on. So we don't teach anything that's controversial. There's nothing we'll say where you'll go, oh, wait a minute. That's not, that doesn't work for me. It's, those got thrown out a long time ago. Yes? What are some best practices to become more self-aware in preparation for this as we do it? Because I noticed like a few times, like I'll be with uh, my scheduler and like, she's like, oh, like, you okay? I'm like, why? They go just an hour ago, you look mad. And like, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. So like, something that you had mentioned, you know, when you think of somebody that you're grateful for or, or something that you're doing, you look out for that. Yeah. And that is easier for me to go and do rather than just like start becoming self-aware of like right. everything that's 
going on and trying to be a good yeah. influence? How can we be more self-aware of like, this program specifically? Yeah, well, in fact, we teach this. What, one thing is, we, we, what, one thing we teach is, is remember, everybody's got their stuff. And everybody's got their stories. And we say, don't own it. Don't own their stuff, step one, because we want you to be okay. Now, it doesn't mean don't respect it, don't listen to it, because their story's real for them. You know, if her story is that I yelled at her, and I'm sure that I didn't, but she actually thinks I did. So you simply say, I'm sorry that it felt like that. And you don't own their story, you acknowledge their, uh, their position, but then you ask yourself, who am I being, or who was I being, that would allow them to feel that way? Who was I being that would allow them to think I was yelling? Who was I being that would allow them to think that I was upset? And more often than not, you'll realize that there is something that you could have done differently. And you might say, you know, now that I think about it, I was actually, I, was, I wasn't angry, but I was having a bad day. And what I was not doing is I was not in total focused concentration on, on con contributing. In other words, if I had walked in there, like I had promised myself I would do this week, and made them my total focus, and I'm gonna make sure that when they leave me, that I'm the best part of their day, that, that they feel better about themselves, I'm gonna find something I like about them, I'm gonna share it with them, and just let them feel more okay. If I were being that guy, there's no way she would have asked that question, right? So, so she couldn't have thought you were angry. She'd have thought, wow, you know, what put you in such a good mood? You did. <laughs> Actually, I did. So, um, yeah, we don't ever teach you to be a victim, but we do teach you to be accountable. So it's not my fault. However, it is my responsibility. It's, I have the ability to respond differently next time. I do have the ability, although I didn't cause this problem, I could have kept it from happening. I didn't make that person upset, but I might have been able to keep them from getting upset, depending on who I chose to be when I got there. And, you know, how far you want. You know, we're not trying to turn macho men into, you know, you know, little sissies, we're, we're saying, you know, within the context of your personality, you get to decide what does compassion look like to you? What is love and compassion and caring? For somebody, it's eye contact and a handshake. For somebody else, it's a hug. So we're not literally here to change your personality. We're here to help your personality flourish without being encumbered by all the dark stuff. And you'll learn about ego and the role that ego plays and the self-awareness is gonna be huge. Once you realize that ego controls almost every single aspect of your personality, it's thinking it's protecting you, but it's your number one enemy. And so I'll have you, one of your exercises is, for the next week, instead of saying the word I, I want you to say my ego. Replace the word I with my ego, because it's in control of your life that much. So you'll say, I'm upset that, you're, that you got here late. No, you'll say, my ego is upset that you got here late. I want that car. You'll say, no, my ego wants that car. You do it for a week and you go, holy cow, my ego is running my life. And egos are not enlightened. Egos ruin our lives. What if you could live without having that? So we have, we call it the three R's. Learning how to recognize when your ego's engaged, learning how to redirect it, or at some, for some period of time, release it. As a coach, you release your ego. For, for a little while, I'll have no ego. There's nothing you can say that will hurt or offend me. You can tell me you did some horrible thing. There'll be no judgment. I'm just here being present and observing in a state of compassion and contribution. Wow, if you could just learn to turn that on a little longer each time, how would you be with your customers or your coworkers or your family or your kids during difficult times? Great question. And the last part you just said, I was trying to figure out a way to word the question and the statement I wanted to ask, and ego is the big word. Yeah. Um, like, coming, a lot of us here have, like, supervisor experience or leadership experience and yeah. the more you do it you kind of your head kind of gets away from it yeah. and as you were going through everything I'm like that's a good check to kind of bring you back down um, to planet earth here with everybody else if you will yeah. and, and just be that nice honest guy and sit down with people and talk to them and, and more of people need to close their mouth sometimes and just listen to other people and I think that comes with checking that ego as a leader and as a supervisor and so like, when I first heard about this program, when I got the email from Cam, I was pretty excited. Like, we've, we've gone through quite a few of these, and not here, but in previous jobs. And I'm always, there's always one thing I take out of it, and it changes my life. So every time a company offers something like this, I'm always excited. Because there usually is something in there that I take back home, and it changes my life outside of work. 
the yeah. inside the work stuff is always there. Like it changes pretty instantly. Yeah. Uh, but I'm always really excited for this stuff about what I can do at home with it. Sure, because you don't wake up, you know, so and so the supervisor of this. Exactly. You wake up as what's your name again? John. You you wake up as John. Exactly. And then you're and then your daddy. And then you're the husband. And then eventually you get to work and now you're John the supervisor. But if we, yeah. And, into, and then you guys are closing the gap and taking it back and doing it at the end of the families. And I think that's awesome. Um, like that, my wife was pretty excited about that. She's like, oh, what? They're going to offer this to like families? Because she works from home, so she doesn't get a whole lot of interaction with people. So when she saw that, she was like, oh, well, you're going to bring some of this back. It's like, she's a supervisor too. So she was like, awesome. Like, yeah. She was very excited for it too. So I'm, I'm looking really forward to this. Awesome. Well, John, I'm happy. Welcome, welcome aboard. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, we're hoping that those of you who decide that you want to be, uh, that you're really excited about ultimately leading teams would be, of course, the first six people all need to be people who say, I want to lead, because they're going to be the first ones who are ready to lead. They'll be co-leaders in three months from the time we start, and full leaders within six. So, you know, so we're starting out with leaders. And when I say leaders, again, you don't need to have gone through leadership training school. For us, a leader is nothing more than, and, and even if you, you, you're clearly a leader, but if you hadn't been, it's nothing more than somebody who says, I want to I want to learn this and I want to share this. And I will keep my promises. Which means I'll show up for those calls too. That's about all we need to have somebody be considered a leader. I'm committed to this and to helping others because, you know, that's a pretty good feeling at the end of the day. As I, and you will find the people on these calls, you'll have them on there. There'll be somebody break loose crying and just say, man, you have no idea how much I needed this today. This changed my life. And it happens, and it'll happen again and again. People will be making life decisions. You'll help be helping them through challenges that none of you are aware of. And you'll create a, a space where you can be vulnerable and where you feel safe. And it just takes on a culture of its own. But when you come to work, and everybody's able to use the same terms and something happens and somebody comes in yelling and, they, and you have five people all go, what's great about that? And they all laugh and they figure it out. You'll be like, oh, yeah, that's great. 